All right, all right, all right. Welcome to Closer Cult Podcast. My name's Alma Merrill, and today we have Mr. Jimmy Rex. <laughs> What's up, man? Good to be here. <laughs> Just want to thank you for being here. Uh, also in the studio today, we have my nephew, Cameron. You guys can't really, I don't know, you can't really see. He's like, uh, he's over there. He's over there somewhere. I think I just took that. Oh, yeah, we're good. Anyways, <laughs> there we go. Let me get Jimmy back. So Cameron's over there. There's Cameron. There we go. And uh, yeah, we're live here in studio and excited to be here. So Jimmy, dude, thank you so much for being on, man. No, man. Thanks for having me. It's fun. I, I have to admit something, though, to you. Uh, <laughs> the other day when I went to watch you speak at that investors, uh, uh, thing, that investors meeting, um, I went just so I could ask you to be on the podcast. So I, <laughs> I hope you'll forgive me uh, for that. Uh, but here's the cool thing about it. Like that was one of the most intense and best like speeches I've heard on the current market and what's happening that I've heard period. So thank you for doing that. And uh, I was really awesome. It was really, really happy to see that you were on there and that you posted that on Facebook and stuff like that. Yeah, no, you bet, man. I mean, it's, you know, and I'm happy to be on the podcast. I, I love helping people that are, that are, you know, hustling and we've, I mean, we've been in the market together for gosh, almost 20 years. And so yeah, happy to come on. I, I, you know, I'm, a little over 400 episodes onto my podcast now. And when I was first starting out, dude, I know how the, the Jimmy is. Rex show and you betcha, but you're just trying to get somebody to come on and say something interesting. And I uh -huh. remember reaching out all the time to people just hoping they would say yes. So I try to do the same for other people, you know, dude, thank you so much. Like, honestly, I thought I was a little apprehensive because you, you just never know who's going to be like, yeah, dude, of course, because you're worth a ton. Your time is worth a ton. You know, you make a ton of money. So I'm just like, oh, dude, I hope he says yes. I was legit. Like as well as you and I know each other, I was still nervous because you and I haven't done a ton of like things together in the recent years. And so I didn't know where you were at, man. I didn't know if you were gonna be like, yeah, of course I'll be on a podcast that has 50 downloads, you know? Yeah, no, like I said, <laughs> dude, and, and maybe this again, this will push you over 75 or something, but no, I, you know, and again, like I said, anybody that's taken it serious, I try to, you know, give back that way. I, I set aside X amount of hours a week where I'm trying to help other people. And, right. um, you know, and anyone that's taken it serious, I mean, I knew, I didn't care how many episodes you had, because I knew if you're doing a podcast, you're going to be doing it, you know, to the best you can and make it a real podcast podcast uh i get a lot of young guys will reach out to me that kind of is a lot of my audience is these kids in their 20s and 30s and right and they they always want me to be on their podcast and um it's only about one percent of podcasts ever get past episode 60 and it's actually only like three in a hundred podcasts get past episode like five really yeah wow, so many I people didn't know start that. one and they just don't do anything with it and so yeah. Um, and so I just, you know, I always want to see like, all right, how many episodes in are you? I don't want to be the the first episode, but at the same time, somebody like yourself, I'm just happy to come on and, and nothing else, dude, spend an hour jamming. Well, and I, I'm just learning about how to do all this. You know, I don't know if you know, I had a history in radio oh, and I was oh. on a morning show as a guest uh, on the morning show and fell in love with that concept. Um, but the podcasting is a new thing for me. And so, I mean, what, what advice would you give somebody who's just barely starting out in the podcast world? I mean, and being candid, yeah. your podcast was the first podcast that I've ever listened to. I love that. And so I, yours was the first I downloaded. I started listening to episodes and episodes and episodes. And uh, and then I kind of stopped for a little bit. And then I got like kind of re-motivated to, to do the Closer Cult thing and bring people together. And, you know, some things changed at my previous gig. So it was perfect opportunity, just the right time to be. Yeah, I mean, my best advice is, and I actually got this advice from Tim Ferriss. I had the chance to go to lunch with him a couple of years ago, right when I was starting my podcast. I was oh, like wow. six episodes in. Hell yeah. And he just told me, he said, do the podcast as if nobody's listening to it. He said, do it because you love doing it. Joe Rogan talks about this all the time, too. I mean, they're the top podcast, right? They, If anybody would know. And it's just like, just enjoy it. Just have fun with it. And you'll find your audience. They'll find you. And you'll ultimately get out of it what you're supposed to. But I just, that's my best advice is just have fun. And, you know, for me, I wanted to have something. I live pretty crazy. Uh -huh. I'm pretty sure I'm going to die young. And so. No, dude, you're going to live to be like 100. Either bro. way, dude, like whatever. <laughs> but but I was like, I want to have something out there that showed that I lived and that I, you know, existed. And so for me, it was almost like a legacy project originally. And then I knew it would be a great networking tool. Uh -huh. And so that's the other cool part of it for you. Uh, like I just released one this week on my podcast with Buster Douglas. You know, oh, I had yeah. the chance to do that podcast. Oh, and, and you have to have a reason. In 2022, I tell everybody, 
you got to have a reason when you meet somebody to follow up and to spend time with them. Right. And so by having either a YouTube channel or a popular TikTok or, or, a, or a podcast, you have a reason to get in that room and spend an hour with somebody, spend two hours. And so right. it's, it's a really, really cool way to network. I think it's a funner way than golf, too, you know? <laughs> I know. I hate when people ask me to go golfing because I'm like, gosh, it's three hours. And it's like, by the time I, you know, and I enjoy golf, but I enjoy golf with the people I'm with. It's right, like yeah. for me, uh-huh. I have to really want to be with those people. And so you're kind of stuck there for seven, eight, nine holes if, uh, if you don't want to be with that person. Or 18 you know? if you get the serious guys. Oh, I walk off, dude. I, Do I, you? Yeah. yeah, if I don't want I to can't. be there. I'm to the point in my life, I'm serious. Like, if I don't want to be somewhere, I just leave. <laughs> <I'm> just like, <laughs> I've walked off a golf course on hole six or seven more times than I've finished nine. Guys, that's one of the most uh, like legit uh, inspiring things I've ever heard. <laughs> like, if you're done, dude, just walk yeah, just, off. Yeah, well, we have this like preconceived notion that we can't. It's like, no, no, this is your life. Like, right. you get to choose how you get to do it. And so for me, I've just gotten this thing. I call it radical integrity, where if I'm, I honor myself first, always radical integrity. Yeah. It's just like, if I don't want to do something, I don't do it. And if I do want to do something, I, I'm going to do it. And I don't care what it looks like. I went to my, I'll give you one example. Like I went to my <laughs> nephew's baseball game recently and, uh, he hits first. So I showed up, watched him hit. And then I go to my brother. I go, all right, man, well, I'll see you later. I got and this lady that was watching one of the other moms, she's like, you're leaving after one hitter. <laughs> and I looked at her and I was like, um, okay, well, I've probably seen this kid hit more times than 99% of the parents have watched their own kids. By the way, I don't give a shit what you random lady think <laughs> about my ability to watch him or not. This is Why all I had time I? Yeah. for. Uh-huh. See you later. You know, and it's yeah. like, but that's kind of how it is. It's like, I don't know. Like, I always run it through the filter. I'm like, wait, do I want to do that? And if it's a no, then I'm okay. Then I'm leaving. Dude, that's the way I got like with religion for me recently like over the last several years is it's like if i don't want to do it i'm not going to go do it i'm not going to go force myself to do it because someone something expects me to do something that i in my heart i don't want to do you know well there's nothing sadder to me than people that are living a life that's inauthentically theirs you know it's like you only got one of these regardless of what religion or what belief you have like you might have other lives after this one, but it's not going to be like this. Right. So it's like, look, do it. You, you know what? You, and it's not like, do what you want to do, like be an asshole to everybody. It's like, no, right. do what you want to do within the combine, like, you know, the understanding that you're not going to upset anybody else or hurt anybody else by doing that. But ultimately it's your life. Right. And if you can really get clear and here's the problem is most people actually just, they don't have clarity on their own life. They don't have a vision for where they want to be in a couple of years from now, let alone a year from now or whatever, let alone a month from now. So what happens is they just kind of take whatever comes into their life. Uh-huh. Person invites them to do this. Neighbor asks them to do this. Bishop asks them to do this. They just kind of do it. Whereas if you have a clear vision of what you're doing and where you're going and what you want, uh-huh. then you're not as prone to uh, do things you don't want to do because you don't have time. Like, right. you know, that every time I say yes to something, I'm saying no to all these other things that I'd rather be doing. And so for me, it just is a matter of having a vision. And once you get clarity on that, it's actually really easy to say no, because it's like, Oh, I'm sorry, that doesn't fit what I'm doing. Right. And you know, I love what you said earlier too. You said that, and you said this the other day when you were speaking, you said you may get another life, but it's not going to be like this one. Tell me what you mean by that. Well, yeah, I mean, regardless, I've never heard of religious belief where you get to redo the life you just had. And so it's like, ultimately, (laughs) it's like, I don't know what happens after this. I kind of like the idea where I'm at in life where I don't know what happens after this. Uh And I think a lot of people, like, they kind of play down in this life, you know, like the meek shall inherit the earth and, you know, and all these kind of things. And it's like, look, you might have life after this. You might not. But if I believe in a God that's all knowing and all loving. He wants me to live my best life. Right. He absolutely wants me to be happy. And he wants, he wants you, wants to, to, be you to have the joy in the fulfillment. Totally. Yeah. That's the only God I want to believe in. And so ultimately, people that are kind of like sacrificing themselves for the greater good or for what's coming next or another life, it's like, screw that. It's right. Like, I'm going to enjoy this life as much as I can. I'm going to bring, uh, I believe, kind of the philosophy of the... Uh, the but engine. endure. Endure, Jimmy. You must endure. <laughs> even a, if it sucks, even if you're in an abusive word. relationship, <laughs> even if your spouse abuses you and hates you, endure. Oh. Endure to the end. Dude, it's, there's nothing sour to me than people that are enduring. I hate yeah. that word. I, I believe the Egyptians had this, the, their belief was, when you get to heaven, they ask you two questions. Number one is, did you have joy in your life? Mm. And number two is, did you bring joy to others? And I believe in that heavenly yeah, entrance. Like that's do the questions that I'm going to get asked. And so for me, I just go, and I believe in the karmic energy. That's kind of my one belief in God is that everything's karmatic. And so anything that I put out, it's going to come back to me. So if I put out good, good will come back. If All right, I, dude, I only bad, have, I only have a less than I didn't even get a high school education. So what does karmatic mean? 
Um, <laughs> karma, right? Karma. So okay, got anything it. that I put out is going to, that same thing will find me. So if I put out bad, uh-huh. if I'm mean to people, if I'm bad to people, then bad's going to come back to me. Gotcha. And if I put out good, then good's going to come back. Dude, I got no bones about admitting when I don't know what the hell. Like, yeah, no, means. it's actually, <laughs> dude, that's a, that's a really good trait because so many people try to act cool. Dude, by the way, I was talking about somebody about this the other day. When it comes to investing and like where to put your money and stuff, right. I think that I got in more trouble by being afraid to say, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, yeah. Than anything else because I didn't want to sound stupid. And I remember looking at like pro formas or, uh, uh, you know, whatever Excel spreadsheets that had waterfalls and just, you know, had broken these deals down. And I didn't want to sound stupid. Right. So I acted like I understood it and ended up investing in this thing that was a total dud from the beginning. I never stood a chance of making money on it all because I didn't want to sound stupid and be like, I don't understand what this means. Did I find that all the time? Because being canned, like I couldn't read till I was 12. I couldn't wow. spell till I was 21 on my mission, on my LDS mission. And uh, so like I'm still learning stuff like, you know what I know based on what you've seen me do in business, because that's all I've done is the last 20 years almost that I've been in business uh, in real estate. That's my entire business acumen. Like I, that's all I know. You know, and so when it comes to like investing and stuff, I've learned that all along the road, like big, massive failures and such. Yeah, no, but props to you, man, because it's like the people that are afraid to sound stupid Uh usually end up making those mistakes. And so I can honor anytime somebody's like, hold on, what are you you talking about? You You and when you and I met, I had only known how to spell for two years. Wow. Not wild. wild. You're writing contracts. Uh (laughs) Yeah. I had had somebody that worked for me one time and I didn't know this till well, a couple of weeks later, but they were dyslexic or whatever, which is it where they, they mix up words. That's and, dyslexic. Okay, yeah. yeah, yeah. And they kept putting the wrong damn address on all my envelopes that were mailing out. <laughs> so I kept getting all these addre- these mails back and I kept looking at the addresses and they're totally wrong. It's like instead uh-huh. of 429, it's 492 and <laughs> 942. And I'm just like, Ouch. this is a problem. And then I'm like, oh shit, good thing I didn't have her doing any contracts. But right, like, yeah. ultimately I had to let her go because she just, she kept screwing everything and she, because of the dyslexia. So it's like, you right. Know, but no, no. I, t- I always tell my clients, I'm like, dude, I thank you for reusing me. Like if I would not have used me if I were you back when you first did a deal with me, but thanks for trusting me and believing. Yeah. In but me. you had the same thing that I had when we were younger, we didn't know anything is you had energy and hustle, right? And those will get you a long freaking ways, man. When somebody knows you're at least working hard for them, you're hustling, you've got, you're at least trying, right? That goes really far. And you can make up for a lot of lack of knowledge when you are putting the effort in that way, you know? Right. Well, and I've been blessed, man. I've been blessed to rub shoulders with people, you know, like you and, you know, you got the, the Boyd Browns of the world, the, the George Morris's, the, these people who are just such amazing influences around me. And then just having, being able to have access to people like that, it's, it's like blown my, my world right, well, you know, right open and, and fixed all of my, you know, preconceived notions of what I could or couldn't do, you know? Yeah, no, it's, it's, and that's with anything, it's, you know, making sure you have, trainers or mentors or coaches or people that are kind of helping you avoid the obstacles that most of the time they made. I right. Mean, that's all I do with my coaching is I just teach people not to make the mistakes that I did. Now t- let's talk a little bit about your coaching company. So tell me, we are the, they Yep. do that. That is one of the coolest phrases I've ever met or I've ever heard. It's like, it, it, it's totally speaks to you immediately. Thank you. So help me understand, like, what did you, how did you come up with that, that, that yeah. name and what do you do in that coaching? Yeah, no, it's funny. I was at lunch today with a, a lady that we got into real estate at the same time, and she was telling me a story. She was sitting next to somebody in a meeting, and somehow they knew that we were friends or whatever. And, uh-huh. and she said that they were like, what is Jimmy doing? What is this weird that they think? And she was kind of all negative. <laughs> and then she explained it to him to the lady, and she was like, oh, that's actually really cool. But long story short, um, I used to work with Operation Underground Railroad. We'd right, go undercover knew, yeah. with them. And and I went on an op that was pretty scary. It was in Latin America. And um, we, and you um, did that with Tim Ballard, right? Uh-huh. That's yeah. freaking sick, dude. Yeah. So I got to go on 11 ops over a couple of years with them. And this was probably the holy s- cow. You went on 11. We went on a lot. Yeah. Whoa, that's sick, dude. Yeah. Um, and this was after probably the third or fourth one. It was the most dangerous one we ever had. I mean, this guy was, there was like bad guys and there was evil guys. This guy was evil. This guy dude like had like an organization around trafficking kids. And Jeez. we ended up in an alleyway for 20 minutes speaking with this guy where he had gun on him. I mean, he had his bodyguards. If they knew even for a, an inkling of what we were actually there for, the, you know, we were dead. Um, and I'm telling my girlfriend this on the way home from the airport. We just did the sting. We took him down. It was this huge operation, rescued 15, 16 kids. And, um, and I was telling her about it and she kind of freaked out and she pulls over in my truck and she's like, Hey, I, I want to talk to you about this. Like, I don't want you to do this anymore. And wow. I was like, what are you talking about? This is, this is part of my life's mission now. And, uh, and she goes, I know, but 
like it's so dangerous. It's a bad environment. Like she goes, why can't they just go do it? Right. And without even thinking, I just said, uh, I said, well, there is no they. We are the they. And oh, when I said whoa. that, I was like, it shot shivers down my spine. I was like, holy shit, we are the they. I was like, that's going to be my new motto. Dude, what a great story behind yeah. that. Because I was like, where did you come up with that? It's so descriptive immediately. Yep. It means something to whoever hears it. Mm -hmm. But I always wondered, like, how did he come up with that? So that's when you came that's up with just, it. It just came out of my mouth. And I was like, so I got it tattooed. I never thought I'd get a tattoo, but that became my life motto. You know, it's like, we're not going to wait for other people to step up. Like, something needs to be done. We're going to be the ones to do it. And and so I wanted to do something with it. I wanted to brand it before somebody took it, you know, because I was like, okay, if I tell too many people the story, someone's going to take it. And so right. when I launched my coaching company, that was the natural, easy uh, choice to, to what to name Dude, it. I love that. I love And, you know, I, I told Cameron, he was in town from California. He's, he, they live, he lives down in uh, my Palm Springs, kind of down there. And uh, I was like, dude, if there's one podcast you come see or you come listen in on or be at, you want to be here with Jimmy. Like, this guy is the the real deal. So appreciate that. Yeah, I'm glad to have uh, have Cameron here, too. Doing, well, dude, doing it's, it's so interesting. The younger generation, right? They have these advantages and disadvantages. And one huge advantage is you have access to whatever information you want to get. Right. I mean, if you remember, when we got into real estate, you no one knew where to go for for training and coaching. There wasn't, dude, right. I had, I, I remember going to Barnes and Noble to the audiobook section and I was needed a new audiobook. Right. And bro, I had bought all of them. Like, I had listened well, to we all of them. Well, we were only like six years into the internet, maybe. Totally. Like, and so I'm like, <laughs> brand new. There was nothing else to go. I'm like, oh, I guess I'm going to go listen to Tony Robbins again. And right. now that is advantage that they have is they can get access to so many people and their stories. But it's also a disadvantage because it's so noisy out there, right? right. There's so much to sift through. And so you kind of got to be able to pick. Like, one thing I love about when I was learning how to live life and how to, you know, do real estate was I was kind of pigeonholed into like the same five or six guys. And so instead of going broad and wide, I just went deep. I really internalized all their teachings. I mean, it was Mike Ferry, uh, right. Tom Ferry, yep. Tony Robbins, Zig Ziglar. It was even, remember Matthew Ferry was doing his thing too. At yeah. That time? I never like, resonated with Matt. Really? He wasn't my guy. He he did, I loved his hip, his like self hypnosis stuff. That's Dude, what I, I did to. love that. So yeah. he, he had one called about money, like attracting money. Yes. Yep. Bro. I would listen to that in my car for like, I guess I should give Matt some props. Cause I did yeah. listen to that. Like I listened every to that day every day. Yeah, yeah. So did I. Yep. Yeah. It was deep, dude. That's that stuff was good. It, I think we rewired our brains with that. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And whenever I think back, yeah, it's, it was, it was Mike Ferry, Tom, I'm very Matthew. Matthew was that that, and then I met Patrick once. He came in and did a training when he was working with his dad for a while. Yeah, um, and that was amazing to have those types of mentors that you got to rub shoulders with for sure. And then so. the CDs were, you know, it was Earl Nightingale and Brian Tracy. It was the same ones, but, right? <laughs> but those were good, man. And to this day, if I ever get in a little bit of a just a little bit of a slump, I'll put Earl Nightingale on, right? And just listen to that old school, dude, the classic. Oh, dude, he's yeah. so good. Jim Rohn, you yep. know, those guys that just really got it. Well, that's the thing. It, it's all those principles are true no matter how long ago it was. They're still true today. Oh, yeah. And so if you can follow the principles of those guiding, those guiding principles, that you'll, you'll still see the same results. Yeah. I mean, everything that you hear from all the new people, I mean, from myself included, I mean, it's just another form of talking about what those guys taught in the first place. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You're just so, seeing it differently. I, I said something the other day on one of my podcasts or one of my videos or something on TikTok, and somebody was like, uh, so and so said that first. And it was like, Okay, well, I happen to, <laughs> I've seen a video from the 1970s saying the same thing, and that dude right. was like 12 <laughs> years old at the time. So right. maybe we all are using like the same stories right. and material. I'm like, yeah. I'll credit the person, but it, for all I know, it was some dude in the 40s. So I don't know. Well, and I, 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 I get that all the time when I do like online coaching and stuff like that with my real estate coaching. And they're like, oh, but some, uh, you know, they ask the same questions on this script. And I'm like, well, it's because we're all selling real estate, you know? There's only so many things you can say you know, yeah i used to joke around i'm like there's no new objections in real estate you learn them all yep you learn how to solve them three ways and you're kind of set oh yeah <laughs> there's totally really not a, a whole lot else you need to do yeah they're all gonna ask the same questions on some mm -hmm. level because it's all the same freaking product mm -hmm. in real estate so it gets a little more complicated when you start doing you know other sales and other concepts or you bring you know like a um like a script to other sales companies and sure. rewrite their scripting or something that gets a little more complicated but yeah, as far as real estate, man, it's all the same. Dude, well, here's what I tell people. Like, real estate really is the simplest job in the world. You Basically, there's three things. You learn what to say, uh -huh. like really learn what to say. You learn how to say it, which is just like the art of sales, right? right. Learn how to really say it with confidence. Your tones, right your rates way. of yeah, speech. Yeah, 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 your NLP and all that. And then the third thing is you do it all day. Yeah. That's literally all it is. 
Like if you do those three things, you'll sell 50 to 100 homes a year, period. Easily, right? That's it. That's yeah. the three things. Now, that's not easy, but it's simple. And right. That's it's what simple. Yeah. Simple is a better word for a it. A guy that started reading at 20 years old could figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> right. Exactly. <laughs> Let me ask you this. So um, you're now, you've, you've built this huge real estate empire. It's being kind of ran for you, right? You have people that are running the real estate company. Yep. You're doing a lot of the, the are, we are the they thing. Um, coaching stuff like that. What's next for you as far as what's your what's your current mission, your direction? What's what's your what's your projection for the, the the near future here? Yeah, no, for me. So yeah, thankfully at the end of April, I got to turn over my real estate team to my team. Pretty much runs it now. I you know kind of help out a little bit. And your brother, your brother Dale, does a lot of that, right? Uh-huh, he's one of the yeah. agents there. Yeah, there's a couple of them: Tyler Bennett, and, uh, Chris Francis, a couple other people. But nice. so they, I mean, they do such a good job, and they're so good. Like. I mean, they're so good. My team did almost, we did 495 homes last year. And so to give you an idea, like they, you know, I can give them a lead and I know the lead will get taken care of better with them than it would with me. Really? I just, yeah. Oh yeah. I just yeah. don't have the time to put into it. And so right. I just have to get the lead and get it to them. And then, you know, I don't have to worry about it much, but, um, and so for me, I, I really wanted to go all in. I, you know, it's funny three years ago, well, you might remember this actually Dave Stoko a couple of years ago, yeah. four, four or five years ago, Yeah. he died grabbing rent from one of his renters. Um, he was a realtor, much like us, called a lot of for sale by owners. Yeah. So we knew he was spent, in your office, I think. Actually, right? we I spent years direct, right next to him in the sure. same cubicles. Yeah. We actually a lot of stuff I say that I do in my scripting came from Dave. Like he taught me a ton of that stuff that he learned by trial and error right when I came in. So yeah. yeah I mean, so great guy, obviously. And he was a family man. I think he had seven kids. And when he died, I don't know if you remember, but the news, every single story just talked about realtor shot, realtor gets killed, real right. estate agent murdered. Right. And I remember thinking to myself at the time, I was like, if I were to die tomorrow and all people know me as is a real estate agent, like no offense, like real estate's great, but I'd right. be pissed. Like I am so much more yeah. than that. And it really started this kind of cycle that, that really sprung me into like doing the podcast, doing my, uh, really taking my social media serious, trying to build up this influence, started speaking a lot more, came out with my book. As I started doing all this, Three years ago, I sold the most expensive home ever in Utah. It was a thirty-two and a half million dollar home. Dude, that was wild. It was I saw wild. That. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, and I mean, you can do the math on the check. It was a pretty nice deal, and I was number one that year for most of the year in the whole state as far as agent making money. Right. And um, and I kind of hit this point in August where I went. I'm done with this. Like, I need something else. I should be doing more with my life. Yeah. Did you feel like you hit kind of a pinnacle? It wasn't it kind it, of a mastery it moment? It literally or? hit me in a moment. I was actually doing an, a plant medicine journey, and it was very obvious. It just came oh, to me, okay. like, you're done with real estate. Time Were you out something. of the country at no, this time? Oh, okay. No, I was just at my buddy's house, and it just was, like, very obvious. In fact, the, the facilitator lady, you know, the next day, you're, like, integrating, and I'm talking about this experience I had, and she goes... Uh, maybe sit on that for a couple of weeks. Because <laughs> I'm like, I think I'm done with real estate. And, you know, but that started for me, this process of figuring out what was going to be next. So I started playing with ideas and I started really putting in time and attention into, all right, well, what are, what could I bring to the universe? What could I bring to the world to, to make a difference, to truly change and make a difference? And I started listening to the people that were reaching out to me because I got a lot of messages on Instagram, got a lot of, you know, people reaching out to me. Right. And the same thing kept popping up. Number one was, how do I find a group of friends like you guys have? You guys seem to have the best group of friends. And then number two, it kind of went along with my book, was I feel like I'm stuck. How do I start living again? Like, I feel like I'm just kind of in this place where I'm not really going for it in life. And on a side note with that, I remember one time I went up against you on a listing. You may or may not remember this. We, we competed a lot against each for other sure. back in the day. But I remember going up against you on this listing, and I didn't get it. And you and I communicated on it and you're like, look, my clients are my friends and they are loyal. And I can remember thinking that I, and I never really had that connection with people that my clients could be my friends. I was still in that phase of their it's a business agreement. Mm -hmm. And so you taught me that concept that your clients should be your friends and then that causes loyalty to happen. Yeah. I mean, I'd, I got so sick of the for sale by owner game. You know, I mean, that's all we did for five, oh, yeah. six years. Yeah. And they just, you're, you know, you're meeting them cold and you're trying to sell them and you're pushing them pretty hard and everything. And then they don't really know you. And I just said, I'm just going to start spoiling 500 to 1,000 people and just let them right. become close friends. So once a yeah. month, I would throw a giant client party and really became friends with these people. And um, But anyway, and so when these people kept reaching out to me, I kind of realized like, hey, I know exactly how to build the container to create deep friendships. Like that's something I've always been really good at is just helping people connect on a deeper level. And so I was like, well, that's what I'll do. I'll start a coaching group that does that. 
And I never really liked the one-on-one -on -one coaching. It exhausts me because I put everything into every call. And yeah, I can only do it, one or two a day before yeah. I'm like exhausted. And it does exhaust you because you have mm -hmm. to switch back and forth so much. Totally. Yeah. And so for me, I did. I know I didn't want to do one-on-one. -on -one, so I kind of uh, talked to you know Ryan Stuman, the hardcore closer, and Sean Whalen with Lions Not Sheep, a couple of these guys that had groups. And I kind of got an idea for what they were doing. And I said, you know, I think I can do something similar, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put a couple of these extra elements in it that I know have helped me to connect on a deep level with a lot of people, which is going on adventure trips, spending time together um, on road trips, things like that. And so that's how We Are The They kind of came about. And that's why I started it. So yeah, we've been <laughs> going, we launched it almost exactly a year ago. It was the last week in October last year is when I opened it. it and t talk a little bit about what you do on those events or on those, uh, yeah, at those events. Cause it's like, I, I saw somebody get waterboarded, man. I saw, I mean, I saw there's people jumping off cliffs. Yeah. Like, what? you do some crazy shit. So let's talk a little bit about that. Like, what do you do there? Yeah, so one of the main things that I've noticed in life is people get stuck and they, they you know, they fall into fear and, and, and it kind of... Um kind of just keeps them from being able to really do what they want in life, whether that's to get out of a relationship, to they're afraid of being alone, or they're afraid of li leaving their job they're miserable in, or whatever it might be. Most people don't regret at the end of their life the decisions they made. They, they regret the decisions they never made. You're right. Those changes right. they knew they needed to make that they didn't do. And so I wanted to be able to have a part of my course that really help people push past their fears. And so we do a lot of crazy shit that gets people past that fear. So we jump off a 250 foot free fall um, rope swing. <laughs> We're and just effing insane when you crazy. watch people do this. Yeah. Like it is crazy, dude. Yeah, the first time I saw it, I was like, okay, that is terrifying and I have to do it. Right? Like <laughs> <laughs> that was my next question. Did you start some of this stuff and, and are you implementing some of this stuff? Cause it's some of the shit that you're like, uh, I need to do that too to overcome some of my fears. Um, most of the things I've done, uh, actually, all of them I've already done. Okay. So cool. like, but I know that they're the things that I grew the most from. So for example, I took everybody in April. We went and swam with tiger sharks and giant hammerheads in the ocean, no cage. So sick. And I remember the first time I did that, like it forever changed me. It was just like you see this shark coming at you. I mean, it's a twelve. They could ruin shark. your everything. Uh, yeah. yeah. It, but you like, there's such a mutual exchange of respect and love with the shark. And it was just a life changing moment. So I, I might be a little bit of an online stalker. I've seen you do most of this stuff. <laughs> Dude, it's, I get that quite a bit. So that's okay. I was talking to somebody just the other day. I was down in Arizona and we were all hanging out. And this one person, he kind of knew all my stories. And he goes, Dude, I got to confess, man. I've, I've listened to every one of your podcasts that you said. <laughs> and I was like, that's freaking awesome. You're like, thanks, dude. That's dope. Yeah, yeah. And I was like, I was like downplaying one of the recent ones. And he goes, No, I got this out of it. He literally pulled a lesson right out of it. I was like, damn, this guy really like does. It was really cool. I was, I was honored. But no, and so it's uh, you know, but so that's why we did the tiger sharks. And so, like, for example, we did walked on hot coals. Um, I did that with Tony Robbins group, and then right. we did uh we did waterboarding and uh sorry I went to Oh, Dennis yeah. today, my mouth, I feel like I keep biting <laughs> my cheek, but we went to, I just wanted to do things that'll get people past their comfort zone. And so the waterboarding terrified some of the guys going into it, but I mean, it was pretty easy. You could tap out whenever you wanted, but right. um, you definitely feel like you're drowning. Like it's I, torture. I, I, that was, I was like, <gasps> when I saw them doing that, <laughs> I was, for a second, dude, I hit that. Cause well, I don't know if you know, I was in a plane crash. Oh, that's awesome. It was crazy. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I have severe PTSD or had severe P PTSD out of that. And I still feel it every once in a while. And when I watched that, like I have claustrophobia now that I never had that before. Um, and then when I see stuff like that, I can now feel it on a deeper level than what I ever had before. Totally. And so it affects me immediately. I feel it. And That's it's the cool. trippiest thing. So if, if, if nothing good came out of a PTSD plane crash, uh, being able to feel people's emotions and, you know, inner struggles and things like that, I think it really helped. Dude, that's, yeah, what a crazy experience. I, I See, I'm and I'm just all about life experiences, man. Like, that's living, right? Like, here's what I say to the guys. I say, you want to create as much, as many experiences that you'll talk about when you're 90 as you can. Right. Like, if, you, if you're on a day, there's nothing cooler than a day where you know you'll be talking about that day when you're 90. Right. Like, that's living, you know? <laughs> that's a freaking moment in time, oh, dude. Oh, yeah, dude. And the quality and quantity of our life we feel like we've lived at the end is going to be... Um, proportionate to those extreme moments that we had, those big moments. And right. so I try to create, honestly, I try to create a big moment a couple times a week. Wow. <laughs> like, yeah. yeah. Like crazy things. So like, I mean, every week, like last week I flew to Palm Springs and I spent the day at Ed Milet's house. And then I flew from there to Arizona. Where I got to hear more about that too, by the way, continue, but I want to get back yeah, to but Ed I'm, just, I'm thing. always trying to do things that are like going to force me to grow and make me uncomfortable in, 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 in every single way. And so 
you know, from there I flew to Arizona and spent two days hanging out. Then I flew home and we did a big party up in Park City with my buddy. Dude, for his you forgot birthday. to say that you spent before you left for that trip, you spent all this time with Alma Merrill. Exactly. The, dude. We had we reminisced and What's chatted. It's funny, like the <laughs> night that I the night that I spoke, right? I did a client party from five to seven thirty. Uh-huh. Um with we had seven hundred fifty clients show up and then I ran up to speak for an hour with you guys. Right. And then I ran from there. We went uh to a buddy's house and had to uh he was uh He's just going through a hard time. He's financially, he, COVID hit him really hard, almost died. And so he hasn't been able to work. And um, his car is like on its last leg. It was his 40th birthday. And so I put a text out to our coaching group and my fantasy football group. He's in both of them. Uh-huh. And I just said, hey, guys, so-and-so is having a, a little bit of a tough time. Let's put some money together and try to get him a down payment for a car. Whoa, and, bro, dude. we raised $20,000 in one day what? from this group. Done, paid, sent me the money. And uh, so at that birthday party, right after I spoke to you guys, we, Whoa, went, we gave him a new car. Are you kidding me? Yeah, that dude? was all in a day, bro. That was one day. <laughs> that was one that day, was, dude. That was Tuesday last week. <laughs> what a gift, bro. What influence that you have on people that where you can make a $20,000 car happen like that. Yeah, it was cool, man. It that's was so life. Fun. I know. That's that's, that's my why, point. Right? Like, that's That's the dude, why. That guy, he's texted me like 10 times since. Like, dude, I'm crying again. I can't believe how much. <laughs> and what it, it's not even about the car. It's right, about that right. this guy who struggles to feel how much he's loved could actually understand. Like, bro, we just love you, man. Like, right. you're just one of us, you know? And I love what you did with the $100 dinner club. Yeah, yeah. well, I mean, speaking of which, so the yeah. Wednesday, I go on my buddy's private plane. We fly to Palm Springs, right, for the Med Milat thing. At the same time, that night, 13 guys from my coaching group did the $100 dinner club. They gave the waiter $1,300. Wow, and, yeah. You know, I mean, it's just always trying to create these experiences and these moments for people. Because, I mean, life's hard, man. People are going through it all the time, right? Um, and you just never know. And so it's, for me, I just, how can I show up and try to influence for good and try to do good by people? I mean, that's really... And selfishly, it's a really fun way to live. And so oh, yeah. you just get to have a fun so, life when you're doing Selfishly that. being unselfish. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You yeah. know, I always wonder that. Like when, when I when I contribute on that level, like I've, I've done your $100 dinner club several times yep. and contributed to that. And I always think, man, I get so much more out of it than the 100 bucks that I put in. Uh, am I being selfish by doing <laughs> that? You know? Sure. In the best way possible. Right? Yeah. Like it's not, but it is. But it's like. I just, I love to experience those things. And, you know, one of my sayings that I came up with that my buddies love to quote me on is um, people that say that money doesn't buy happiness is never given enough of it, to, of it away. Oh, yeah, for because sure. Because when you start giving away money, like, we're, I'm hit it up from here. We're going to go and <coughs> I'm doing this contest where I'm going to give away a bunch of money for, we're going to do this, like, deal or no deal thing for Halloween. <laughs> with, and we just have all these boxes and we're going to just go random people and give away a bunch of money and stuff. And it's well, just fun. Ultimately, money's energy. Right. I mean, you're, totally. you're offering people energy, you're giving them opportunity and you're, you're helping them live smoother no matter what. Right. Yep. I mean, if you can really view money in that way, it really becomes so much more of a gift. Yeah. And it's like, it's not like you just give away money to everybody like they did during the pandemic. That doesn't right. solve anything. Right. But right. like on a one-on-one basis, you absolutely can change somebody's world with a couple thousand bucks and and then you do teaching like that's what my whole thing is about like i'm trying to teach people every day how to live a little bit better how to you know be a little smarter with money how to create financial wealth get your house in order some of these things but ultimately you know you help in every way possible spiritually physically mentally and emotionally and you can make a big difference man so it's we are the they is there a dot com dot org what is it yes the website is we are the they movement.com okay and um, we're going to be opening it's a it's a men's group so as of now we're gonna you know we have something for the wives and girlfriends that we do once a week as well a call with them but it's not open to the public yet but um we're gonna open the group back up december 1st and uh at that time um have more guys but we have a couple hundred guys right now and um, it started a movement, man. It's yeah, it's pretty incredible. And it seems to be really highly energetic. Like I, I've really enjoyed to watch kind of how that's grown and yeah, no, the, I, the caliber of people that have really progressed through that process. Well, dude, we have, I mean, that's the cool thing about it. this is not a group for broken men. These are guys that are already kicking ass. I mean, it's 1500 bucks a month per guy. So this isn't a cheap program. Right. Um, but we do extreme things. We, you know, I'm throwing everything back into the program. Um, but ultimately it's for men that are already kicking butt in life and they just want to tweak one or two little things. Like the person that can't see that they have a couple of things they can tweak. Like I feel sad for that person. Right. We all need right, coaching. Where's we their all growth, need, right? Of course. Yeah. And so for the group, I mean, we have guys worth nine figures, multiple. Um, I have guys that, then I have guys that have to work for me because they can't afford the program. Like the guy we gave the car to, you know, right. we have everything. And one of my favorite things, the first event we ever did, I set the tone from day one, we had a dude fly in on his private jet 
and he shows up and you know, but he was late and I'd already given away all the beds. We all sleep in the same house. I had this house, I had 50 beds, there was like 54 <laughs> of us. So I made him sleep on a couch. So the guy that flew in worth nine figures on his private jet slept on a couch day one. And he, and he didn't bitch about it. I thought you were going to tell me he had to sleep on the jet. <laughs> <laughs> but it was pretty funny and uh, kind of just set the tone for everything. It's like, no, everyone's treated the same here. We, we you know, we all are just trying to help each other. And um, it's really cool, man, because the group ends up helping each other and they have this brotherhood. I mean, again, the birthday party I went to Saturday up in Park City. Um, there was five dudes there that met through We Are The They and they're best friends now. I mean, wow. these guys did not know each other and they're where there with their wives and girlfriends. I can see where that would be. I've gone on a couple of retreats like that and you become, oh, yeah. you. I went with Boyd Brown actually yeah. with Keller Williams. You get it, how quickly yeah. you can develop those friendships. Oh, it's so close. You know, one of the things that I learned on that last retreat is that which is the most sacred is the most universal. Mm. Meaning that, look, we all have our shit. We're all fucking around in life trying to make it happen, trying to make things work. And the the pains that we experience are the most universal pains. Like we've all gone through divorces or breakups or whatever, those challenges. We've all had issues with different addictions. And the more we share those with people, the closer we get because we realize, hey, we are the they. Yeah, well, the three pillars of my program <clears throat> is to be vulnerable, authentic, and in integrity. I love that. Yeah, because... Um, we think if we're vulnerable and if we share things that are a little bit out there, people are going to judge us and they won't like us, but it's actually the opposite. I, mean, right. if, I don't know if you follow me on Facebook, but every I day do, I do definitely. a blog post and I get pretty vulnerable in a lot of them. I share things. And I, I love your, your blog, blog post, dude. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I have a lot of people that will be like, dude, I wouldn't post that. But then I have so <laughs> many people are like, You're all, yeah, this is very authentic. <laughs> totally. And it's like, but people are actually connecting because God, this guy's real. You mm -hmm. know, he's actually saying things. You can tell that like, he wouldn't be sharing this if he wasn't being honest because he wouldn't share this. Right. And it just makes people that much more, um, feel like they can connect with you. Right. And they, you know, and it brings them closer because yeah, I mean, everyone has their shit. Like you said, everybody knows that they have things they got to work on. And so when you act like your whole life's put together, you wear that mask, right? You actually energetically block the ability to connect. And that's why vulnerability is such a superpower. Um, because when you do it, you absolutely just open the floodgates for people to be able to come to you and to be able to and express that's, that. That's in your personal relationships too, right? Your marriage, your, oh, your girlfriend, your everything. Especially in those relationships. Yeah, I would say especially. You know, my first marriage, you know, it ended in a tragic divorce, as you remember. Um, and, and there were a lot of things I did really well, and there was some really shitty stuff. Some stuff that I just kept inside and didn't share. Of course. When I started to get really vulnerable with my current wife, like from day one, I I just was so vulnerable and I was so open about everything. She, she knows me for me now. And I, there's nothing that I've done or do that she doesn't know and doesn't love support and care for me. Yeah. Well, what because I, of those what I tell my guys, it's like when you're hiding anything from your wife or your spouse, your girlfriend, whatever that you, again, you put an energetic block between you. If that's not your safe place, if that's not where you can go and be completely open and vulnerable and a mess and whatever else and be loved in that space, then what the hell are you even in the relationship? Well, yeah, for? why are you like, there? Otherwise, yeah. it's just not a safe relationship. And so I tell them, yeah, I shouldn't said, it be closer than your buddy's relationship? Sure. And yeah. so me and Sean Whalen talk about this a lot. He, 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 his whole thing is about being a free man. That doesn't mean freedom like independence from the government or all these things. What it means is your soul's free because you're not hiding, you're not living this lie, you're not wearing a mask. Like when you live as a free man, it's when you've able to express things that make you less than a desirable or perfect. Because here's what I tell the dudes. If you have things you've never told your wife, maybe you cheated on, maybe you went to a strip club, maybe you have a porn problem, whatever it might be, like right. whatever issue you deal with that all guys deal with. Right. When you don't tell that to your wife, you don't trust the love that you're getting because you think to yourself in the back of your mind, if she really knew who I was, she wouldn't, she wouldn't love, love me. me. So right. when you express that and you actually get vulnerable with it, and you feel loved in that state, then you're like, oh my gosh, she actually loves me. Like I have a guy in my group that for his work, he um, worked with some uh, super famous uh, musicians and things like that. And um, they would go to strip clubs and his wife, they were super LDS. Like that was a no, no in right, that marriage. Course, right? Yeah. And he never told her. And after our second event, he finally went home and he talked to his wife about it. And he said for about four hours, she wouldn't talk to me. Uh -huh. And then she came over and sat next to me and said, thank you for telling me I love you. And he said, and he's just bawling. He's like, dude, this is the first time in my life I know my old wife loves me. Right. Like, I know it now. And he's like, I've never felt so much love. And it's like, dude, that's the reason you get vulnerable and authentic. That's the reason you go into integrity because you can then feel that true love where people actually love you for who you are. And by the way, when people dislike you, you're totally fine with it because you're like, cool. It's just not my person. Like, right. I'm not like, I have so many people come at me because I put a mirror in front of them and I go, here's what 
you could right, do. Exactly. And some yep. people don't like that. So they, they don't either have like to it, change man. their yeah. minds or they got to uh-huh. make me wrong. And I just laugh, dude. I'm like, honestly, I'm like, all the people that truly know me seem to like me. So if you don't like me, it's like almost my own joke. It's like, yeah, that's cool. We're just not friends. Like you don't know me. Like, <laughs> and I'm okay with that. I, I love how just down to earth you are and how just forthright you are with everything. And you've been that way for a long time. Like, yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. I, it's, plus <laughs> I, it's too exhausting to be any other way. You right. Know? Like it's really nice to just be like, wait, if I don't want to do something, I just say no. And right. then I don't have to like worry about it. And if I want to be away, I, I just do that. And I kind of just have come to the acceptance of, I know who my people are and I know they're going to love me. Like I tell, I had a friend one time and he, you know, came with something that he had done and he's like, well, you still need my friend. And I said, let me, let me just explain this to you. <laughs> Can I swear whatever I want on your podcast? Of course. Fuck yeah. Okay. So I, I, <laughs> said, I said to him, I said, dude, just so you know where this friendship stands, you can't fuck it up. Like I can't love you more and I can't love you less. I just love you because I do. Right. Like it's not contingent upon how you show up or how you treat this relationship All right how many births if you become toxic to, you're not yeah. gonna see me much other than that like bro like we're just homies we're just going to be close friends because i freaking love you right and that's it and you uh, can know that this is always going to be the case and so anyway and so it's like it's really cool to be able to have those kind of relationships where i can come to these guys and i'm like dude you're not gonna believe what i did and i'm just laughing at myself <laughs> and just the dumbest shit right like right. i still screw stuff up all the time and I don't have to worry about judgment. Like, I won't hang out with people now. I will not be close to people if I have to watch what I'm saying around them. Right. If I have to worry about the way that I'm appearing to them. Like, right. you either got me or you don't, right? Right, because that's because you're, you're being who you really are on the inside. Like, who, who you are when nobody else is around is who you really are. And if you yep. can't be that when other people are around, you're not being authentic, right? Yep. Fair statement? Yep. So tell me this. You're a closer, man. You're a big-time closer. Like, you've closed big deals You've closed amazing opportunities for people. You've met with incredible individuals throughout your life, like Sean Whalen and Ed Ed Milet and things like that. Let me ask you this. Let's say I'm a new agent. I'm brand new. I'm in sales in general, or I'm selling houses. I'm coming into the marketplace. You mentioned this the other day um, when you were speaking, that the key to people surviving in this upcoming market is to learning the skills, the simple skills that we used to do back in the day, right? What are your thoughts on that? Like, is it, they got to learn how to prospect they got to learn how to make calls. Like what's your perspective right now, as far as what, what people need to do right now in the marketplace? Yeah. People have to, well, first you have to learn it yourself. Like you've got to know what the market really is. Um, self-awareness is probably the most important skill somebody can have, right? Not, Gary not Vayner, hearing it from somebody else. Gary but Vaynerchuk yourself. talks about that. Like just really being self-aware. Like, Hey, what do I actually need to do to sell this house? Like if I'm right. being real with myself, what price does it need to be at to sell? Like, right. And then you get really clear on that. And then you need to get really good at being honest with people. Like I always, you know, I'm the guy you come to, to hear what you need to hear, not what you want to hear. Right. right? <laughs> and I'm fine with that. Like I'm, you know, like when I, I had a guy yesterday and one of the dudes I coach and he'd been being a dipshit. And, um, and I just said to him, I said, yo, bud, I said, this is your last chance here. Like I, you know, if you want to be a part, cause he loves the group. He wants to be a part. He's like, you group saved my life. Keep me alive. Right. I said, well, good. The and we are the day. Yeah. And okay. I said, and this is your last fucking chance. Like if I hear one more thing like this, you're out, dude, you represent me. When you put that hat on, you put that shirt on. I right. said, we don't do that shit. Right. And I said, are you done? And it was just like, I was like, sometimes they need tough love like that. Right. Uh-huh. But then like just being able to be honest with yourself, like most agents really work about four hours a day. And one of the things like what, what it's going to take to really thrive in this market, you can get through it. But right. Do you want to get through it or you want to thrive? Like right. When, right. in the exactly. last downturn, dude, I was literally working so hard for 10 to 12 hours a day. I was on the phones, pounding phones. I would spend, I mean, I had 50 listings and I was selling right. maybe tw- two a month. So you're on the phone with your sellers every single week trying to get price reductions. And I was having deep, honest conversations. I mean, I was drilling them. But it ultimately got me really good at just being honest with people because people here's here's my whole theory with real estate. All your clients want is the best information possible so that they can make the correct choice for their so family. If you're not being right. honest to them, they can't even make the right choice. And so my whole theory was like, I'm going to be honest and let them make the decision. Right. So I would just tell them, like, look, if you want your house, like right now, if you got a house for sale for seven hundred fifty thousand that was four fifty four years ago when you bought it, guess what? It's not selling for seven hundred now. It's gonna sell for six or right. five fifty. And you gotta be honest about that. Otherwise no one's buying it. Rates are over seven percent. And so I just got really good at being super honest with people. See, look, dude, if you want to sell your house, this is what it's gonna take. Or if you want to buy a house, here's what I recommend, you know? And 
And so I think the number one skill you can have is that radical integrity is just being really honest. But then it's the consistency, dude. You have to go to work every single day and do the hard thing. It's so easy to get... Uh, to convince yourself you're working in real estate without actually doing anything. And how, right? how would you recommend somebody line out their day? I know for years, I could probably tell you what your schedule was for years because you and I subscribe to the same processes. Yeah, if but somebody seriously wants to be a closer and they want to be a killer, they want to sell 50 homes in this market, 100 homes in this market, here's what it looks like. From 7.30 to 8, you're getting ready. You're printing out your leads. You're getting your emails answered, your whatever. Then from 8 to 11, you're on the phones, period. Prospecting. Yes, you're yeah. calling somebody. I would spend at least an hour of that calling people I know or past clients. I'd spend an hour calling um, warm leads and an hour calling cold leads. Then from 11 to 12, you're doing lead follow-up. Well, from 11 to 11.30, I call it processing time. You're answering your emails. You're taking right. care of whatever voice messages came in. From 11.30 to 12. Right, because it's not going to break your business if you don't answer the emails before 11.30. No, there's <laughs> nothing. Mike Ferry sales time is like, nothing is happening before 11. You can't take care of it. Right. Nothing, ever. And you can convince yourself otherwise, but it's just a lie. Right. Um, and then from 12 to 1, I was going on a lunch appointment with the intent to try to get business. And then from one, so you're going with potential clients or, or yeah, or lenders like SOI, or, you know, whoever vendors, okay. whatever it might've been. Um, and then from one o'clock till six or seven, you're on appointments. And then from six to nine, usually, uh, I'm either spending it with my family or I was networking. I was at some kind of event. I mean, three, four times a week, I was at an event the other couple of days I was usually with my family. And so, right. you know, that's what it looks like. I mean, if you want to be a top producer in this market, that's really what the schedule looks like. And that, that's what, that's what Jimmy did for years. And he's done for years. Um, if you want to see what he does now, he has a video on his, uh, on his YouTube channel it says the day in the life of Jimmy Rex. <laughs> I was so blown away by that, bro. I was watching what you do now, kind of your, what your routines are and stuff now. It's very peaceful. Oh dude. My you life live a is very peaceful my, existence. Like bro, people think they're like, Oh man, thanks for making the time. I'm like, dude, I have, I've never been more busy, but I've never had more time. Like right. I truly like every day I have a few hours where I'm taking care of myself. I go to the gym every day. I do my, um, uh, meditations every day. I go on a walk every morning. I, I mean, I really spend a lot of time taking care of me and I've set it up that way. Right. And so I'm not afraid of hard work, but I also, yeah, I mean, I, it's really cool now. I mean, and then you're just attracting things in, right. It, it went from this total grind to just attraction is what I've kind of focused on now. But here's the problem that a lot of young agents want to do. And they, you know, they want to just use the social media. Dude, if I see, one right. More they want to be so passive with everything. Yeah. They're like making reels left and right that are stupid as hell. It's like, dude, I have a ginormous following online and I wouldn't get any leads if I didn't build this thing first. Like I, you know, I have 70,000 followers on Instagram and twice that on TikTok. Right. And I don't get any leads from my reels. I right. have to like, right. I have to grind the phone still. <laughs> you and still so, have to work. Yeah. yeah. And so anyway, but it's funny, like every agent that comes to watch me or shadow me or anybody, like they all say the same thing. They just go, dude, you're just on the phone all day. It's like, yeah, I'm. Yeah. calling, making business happen, connecting with networking. People. Exactly. Right. And so all day long, that's what I focus on. Dude, Jimmy, dude, it, I could honestly talk to you for like four hours in a row. Like I, I so groove with you and it's, it's been such an honor to know you for almost, geez, we're, we're close to 20 years. Yeah. Bro. I think eight, this is my 18th year eight, coming up. 18 years. Yeah. yeah. So I just want to thank you so much for being on here today and for sharing like all of your light and knowledge. <laughs> no, thanks <laughs> for, for having for me. Sharing your spirit, to, dude. I, I, up. Uh, it's been fun to watch you grow and progress and to see things happen in your life. And, um, so, so, so Mr. Jimmy Rex on where or, on Instagram, on yeah, Instagram. that's the best way to get a hold of me. Yeah. Cause I post every time I'm doing an event or I'm speaking or I, you know, I have something come out, a new podcast, wherever I post it all on my Instagram. So okay. Mr. Jimmy Rex is the best place to follow, follow me at. And then, um, and, and I just tell people, if you have any real question, I always answer them and I answer my own stuff and happy to, so if anybody has anything I can help you with, reach out. Dude, that's awesome. And then, uh, we are the they uh, movement.com. Um, dude, Jimmy, thank you so much. Like I said, man, I wish we had like three more hours to do this, but no worries, man. What a Appreciate blast. You. Guys, hey, thank you for listening in to Closer Cult Podcast. My name's Alma Merrill. I want to thank Jimmy Rex for being on today and for uh, all the positivity information. And, uh, God. If you guys need uh, amazing coaching for life and otherwise, hit up uh, We Are The They and uh, follow Mr. Jimmy Rex online. We'll see you guys next time. <laughs>